Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Barth. I'm a public information officer with Pacific Northwest Team 2. I wanted to welcome you all to the virtual public meeting for the Cameron Peak and uh, Thompson Zone of the East uh, Troublesome Fire. So again, today is uh, Thursday, October 29th. I wanted to provide you with updates about the Cameron Peak and Thompson Zone of the fires today. Uh, tonight, we are going to have a lineup of speakers to be able to provide you with what's going out, on out on the ground and the plans moving forward. Uh, for our agenda tonight, we're going to be hearing from our fire operations uh, section chief, uh, Kyle Cannon. We will have remarks from our incident commander, Rob Allen. Then we'll have a few uh, comments that will be coming in from some of our cooperators that I'll be sharing and reading out loud and then we'll be doing questions and answers. So we do want to hear your questions. We want to get your feedback. We've been collecting some of those during the day, and we ask that you go ahead and type those into the comment section, and we'll get to them uh, later on in the meeting. Um, before we get started, I would like to just uh, let everybody know the Cameron Peak Fire is 208,663 acres. It's 64% contained. The Thompson Zone is 4,346 acres, and still 0% contained. As of this morning, there was 1,558 personnel assigned to the fire. That number will likely go down in the next coming days, but we'll hear more about that uh, as we talk about the updates. So with that, I'd like to pass uh, the uh, mic over to Kyle Cannon, Operations Section Chief. Thank you. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Kyle Cannon, Operations Section Chief for Pacific Northwest Team 2. So last weekend's snow uh, was very beneficial at dampening the fire behavior and really slowing down the fire. In fact, uh, we had uh, up to 27 inches reported out here in Pingree Park. So that definitely helped in a lot of ways. That said, it also has made it pretty difficult for us to access the fire line across the entire fire area. Uh, those roads, steep roads and difficult muddy areas, it's been pretty tough to get in there over the last three or four days. So our plan over the last um, three to four shifts has been one to evaluate our uh, ability to get to the fire line and, and uh, in, in order to get in to assess the effects of that snow on the fire. And, what we, and once we can determine, um, you know, what, how the, uh, the snow has affected our fire behavior and what the fire is going to do, and then we can focus where we're going to um, uh, put our energy into and where we can really keep the fire from moving again and protect um, the communities out to the east of the fire. So with that in mind, once we can get into those areas, and some of them we've already been into, we're going to focus on those same areas that prior to that snow event were, uh, were problem areas for you. So, you know, we're talking about the... Uh, the um, Thompson zone of the East Troublesome here where it moved towards uh, Estes Park on last Friday. Uh, we're looking at the piece above Cedar Park in this area, uh, Storm Mountain Country, uh, Glen Haven in the retreat and the slop over over the North Fork, uh, Pingree Park, um, and then also this piece along in Buckhorn here. So that's where we're going to be focusing as we get um, access into those fire areas. So with that, the current situation, um, starting down here on the uh, Thompson zone, We've had good access over the last couple of days. So we've got some good intel on what's going on. We've got plans uh, to uh, continue to improve the indirect fire lines that were started both by the park, by Rocky Mountain National Park and the previous team. And we're also looking at direct options to go in and uh, basically secure that edge. In fact, uh, this piece on the southern piece, or the southern part was worked on today already. So things are getting, uh, the snow's melting off pretty quickly in some areas, especially the south aspects. Uh, coming around up into uh, the south part of the Cameron Peak Fire above, Cam or above Cedar uh, Park. This piece in here looks pretty solid. We were able to take a look at it, and our plan is that tomorrow we were going to call that contained uh, for the most part. Uh, coming over into this piece around Storm Mountain, we've had uh, difficult access over the last day or two. Our plan is to get in there, check out that, and look at our options, both direct and indirect, to uh, secure that piece over the next couple, three days. Uh, the same with this piece around the retreat. Uh, coming over here into our Division X-ray around Glen Haven and the slop over the North Fork. Uh, that piece, we flew it today. Um, we see some heat along this fire edge here. Our plan is to uh, take a look at that direct, as well as build some indirect control lines if they're needed as things dry over the next few days. Pingree Park, there's also some heat be showing out here um, in this direction, out to the, uh, to the west, as well as out by Comanche Lake. Uh, we'll be monitoring that by air and keeping a close eye on that as well as we go. And then uh, this piece in Buckhorn here in Division Tango on the north side of, uh, of the uh, Cameron Peak Fire. We've got folks in there today checking that edge. Um, over the next two or three days, we're hoping to have that pretty well secured and, and called good. 
And then moving out into Branch 1 on the north side of the fire in Division Delta, a lot of this area is in patrol status. Uh, we'll be looking at repair. We do have a couple of little areas that uh, were left over prior to the, the snow that we need to check um, and make sure that those are, are solid for the most part. We are using aviation assets over the last two or three days after the snowstorm passed away or passed out. We, uh, we have... Uh, We've been doing recons with helicopters. We've also been using uh, drones to take a good look at places in here. And uh, we also brought in uh, the multi-mission aircraft, which, give, which gave us some, uh, some infrared data and some other, area, or other data to show us where those heat areas are now that the, the, the snow started to melt. So that's the update for today. Thank you. Hey, good evening, everybody. My name's Rob Allen. I'm the uh, incident commander for Pacific Northwest Team 2. Uh, we're happy to be here. We talked to you uh, just a few nights ago when uh, Dan Dallas's Rocky Mountain uh, team was uh, on their way out and uh, gave us a really good handoff. We were able to pick up a lot of information, and, of course, the weather gave us a, a big break on being able to get in, as, as Kyle was just talking about. I know one of the, the big things on everybody's mind is when, when will we uh, lift evacuation warnings and, and uh, closures and things like that. Um, you know, every day we meet, um, Kyle and his folks get out there, the ops folks get around and look, see what's out there. The Sheriff's Department is out cruising around with them also. Uh, and then we have several meetings throughout the day where we'll get together and talk about what's out there. And, and when we feel safe, we'll make a recommendation to the Sheriff's Office that there is no threat from the fire anymore. Uh, we can we can look at loosening up those those evacuation signs. We had a meeting just yesterday up in Estes Park, and that resulted in the end in us opening up a, a lot of country in that area. Uh, and we'll keep looking at that every day as we go through uh, working with uh, with the sheriff's department, with uh, with uh, Colorado State and um, Forest Service and the Park Service on where we can get in and where we can move. Um, some of the other things that we've been trying to work on too, and, and one of our big issues, uh, especially given the way the weather is and time of year, uh, getting things ramped up and ready to do what we call fire suppression repair. Uh, so there's a couple of things that'll happen uh, after a large fire like this where we'll come in and we'll go in with the suppression crews that we have now, the crews that put in the line, and fix those lines and repair them up to try to eliminate any other damage that might happen as the weather changes. As we finish with the repair work, um, and that's basically us fixing all the damage we did in the effort to suppress the fire, a second team will come in uh, called a BEAR team, a Burn Area Emergency Response Team. They'll come in and they will start looking at what real problems might come, especially in those large drainages uh, where the outflows might be and where we might need to do things like put in larger culverts or put in seeding. Uh, where we're trying to really make sure we're taking care of erosion and, and other things that might come down the hill. So those are the next two steps going forward as we start to wrap up where we are with uh, the fire suppression part. Um, we've had a lot of firefighters around here for, for quite a few days now, living in and amongst you uh, in hotels because of the weather, not, not able to operate out of our normal operating space where we would put everybody into a big field and into camp and they'd be in tents. Uh, we appreciate everybody's help with them and all of, uh, all of the, the, the support that we've been getting for those folks as we've been getting through this time. We haven't wanted to release everybody and send them home uh, because then we'd have to just bring them back when we saw something happen. So we're making sure we have um, the resources we need on hand so that as this starts to change and we get back into uh, warmer weather, we, we've got a, a, a space that's going to play out here. And, um, once the snow goes off, we'll have a few days until yet till we're f completely snow free everywhere. I've seen a lot of uh, photos from the guys flying on what they're seeing out there. Then it's going to be three or four more days after that to those fine fuels, those needle casts, the, the brush, the grass uh, will be receptive to fire again also. So we're, we're still looking a week out before we have the opportunity for the fire to really get up and start moving again. It's still out there burning. The heavy fuels will continue to burn. They're really dry. Um, they'll keep moving around in the large fuels, but to get up and get a run, we're still a ways out from that. And then we talk to our meteorologists and see when the next storm's coming in. And this time of year, we know we're going to end up with more storms coming in. So we're trying to set ourselves up for the future, uh, being able to be prepared. But that also means we might have a very short window to get in there when the roads are stable enough for us to put heavy equipment on it and go in and fix some of the things that we did, do that repair work I was talking about. So it's a, it's a balance right now of being prepared and having enough stuff on hand and also being uh, responsible enough not to hang on to everything while there might be needs elsewhere. 
Uh, one of the advantages we do have as things start to get better right now is um, nationally, um, our fire programs run on a, a preparedness level, uh, five being the highest preparedness level we have, and then one being the lowest. Uh, the region right now has dropped back down to a lower preparedness level. Nationally, we're dropping down to lower preparedness levels. And what that tells me as an incident commander is that there's more resources in the system should I need them when we go to get them. So some of the folks that have been working here for, for uh, multiple uh, rotations, time to get them home, get them rested, be able to bring back people that are, that are ready to go and be able to, to continue to engage. So uh, just so you know, we're here uh, for our rotation here. We're, we're um, uh, gathering the intel that we need, making sure that we have the plans in place to be responsive when we see those opportunities. Uh, Today is a good example. We had a couple of places where uh, as soon as we were able to get up the road, we got up the road, we put people on the ground, we had them walking out lines, especially uh, up in this uh, upper ridge, the Buck Ridge area, to be able to get a look at those ideas and start to really give us some real intel on what it looks like out there so we can make the proper recommendations back to the Forest Service, the Park Service, uh, the rest of our partners here on what we're seeing. So uh, that's a little bit about what we're up to right now, and I'll turn it back over to Chris. All right, I want to thank Rob and Kyle for those updates. Uh, just uh, wanted to read a few remarks uh, from some of our partners that we've been working with uh, consistently throughout the incident. Uh, first, uh, wanted to share some comments from Sheriff Smith uh, from Larimer County Sheriff's Office, who was not able to join us tonight. Uh, obviously very busy with uh, many things that, that they have going on, but the Larimer County Sheriff's Office uh, statement from, uh, that they shared with us was that they, they will continue to work with the incident management team and other cooperators to reevaluate current evacuation levels and make uh, changes as appropriate based on the current conditions. And again, so that goes right along with what you heard Rob say and all that coordination that's happening uh, consistently throughout this incident has been happening throughout the, again, since the beginning where those conversations are happening to make sure uh, that those, those uh, risk-based decisions are happening and getting folks back to their homes as quickly as possible when it's safe to do so. Um, all, along those lines, ongoing conversations with, uh, with our other partners, I uh, just wanted to share f uh, with folks as a reminder, the Rocky Mountain National Park and all National Forest System lands on the Canyon Lakes Ranger District, district of the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forests uh, are closed, so there's limited recreational opportunities in and around the town of Estes Park. Um, the town of Estes Park is currently open, uh, but with limited services. Uh, visitors who choose to come to uh, Estes Park knowing this information should be prepared to leave at a moment's notice as there's still potential threat uh, from the fire in this area. Um, if anybody has any questions about those evacuation levels, we encourage folks to call the Larimer County Joint Information Center. That phone number is 970-980-2500. Um, also want to share with folks from Poudre Valley Rural Electric Association that they have made some great progress on restor uh, re restoration efforts recently. Uh, they were able to get a few more homes re-energized uh, in the Buckskin Heights area yesterday. Um, due to no access on one pole and having to hand dig uh, and hand set uh, another pole in a ravine, the remainder of Buckskin Heights uh, will not come online until tomorrow. Uh, the remainder of Monument Gulch is still on schedule uh, to be re-energized by the end of the week. Poudre Valley REA uh, will be assessing damage on that line that feeds the Lutheran Camp and Pingree uh, Park on Monday. Um, so just wanted to share that with folks and uh, make sure that all that information is getting out to you and want to make sure that folks uh, are getting the latest information from both the incident management team and our partners. So with that, um, we will have opportunity now for some questions and provide some answers from our speakers. Uh, we will continue to, to answer some of those questions directly as they're coming in on Facebook. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll take some of those questions for the speakers that we have here tonight. So with that, Cale, do we have any questions? Yes, sir. We'll start with operations chief. Kyle Cannon. All right. And Kyle, we have several great questions from the audience out there. Why don't you go ahead and on camera there, Thanks. Kyle. Thanks. So we'll start with um, the Pingree area. What are the chances of the green area around Pingree structures burning? So people on the map are seeing so in this area in here, we do have um, structure protection equipment and personnel out in that area. You know, with the snow, it's um, becoming less and less likely uh, as that snow melts and helps, uh, you know, 
uh, increase the fuel moistures within the fuels. But that said, you know, we do, do still have structure protection equipment out there, pumps, hoses, systems to protect the structures and personnel in there because we're still assessing um, what the effects of the snow have been and what they're going to be on that area. So I would say there still is um, some potential in that area despite the snow. Okay, and I was out there today and noticed that the wind picked up, and so are the locals up in the town of Estes, of course. It was mm -hmm. predicted on our uh, weather matrix, and tomorrow is supposed to kind of peak down again. Um, you also have a fire behavior analyst background. What's the effect of the wind right now up there on the snow and on the uh, kind of evaporation? Yeah, certainly that wind uh, does increase the, the, well, sublimation of the snow, increases that, uh, the uh, decrease in the snow across the area, so that will um, lessen the likelihood of the, of the uh, moisture from that snow getting into the fuel. So the wind is not really helping us as far as uh, moistening those dry fuels. And then, um, did you see much smoke on the fire today? So I did not, but I did not get up in a helicopter. The areas that I could see in here, as well as up in here, um, I did not see much smoke at all. Okay, and then... Um, are, is there still concern about the two fires merging? That was a hot topic during sure. the very dry pre-storm era. Right, and prior to last week, yes, that seemed like a pretty uh, strong likelihood with the storm that came in last weekend, the 27 inches of snow, um, and the conditions that we're seeing and the amount of heat that's still, um, that uh, the amount of decrease in heat in, in, that, in the fire, I would say at this point it's pretty unlikely. Now that said, through time, we know that uh, things can dry out that we've, you know, historically we've seen some fire movement um, even as late as December. So I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's pretty unlikely at this point. Okay, great. And then uh, relating to the Thompson zone again, um, will your team be using dozer lines if needed to stop the fire from progressing into Estes Park and protecting the town? So primary control lines at this point, the indirect lines, which are those lines um, that are not right up against the fire's edge. It's those air, the fire lines um, that are back away from the fire's edge that still have some unburned fuel. We're planning primarily utilize the road system, Highway 34, and uh, I believe it's the Bear Creek Road. Uh, that said, um, you know, the uh, dozer line may be um, an option if needed, depending on uh, where the fire is and what the fire is doing. And I just want to be really uh, clear for this one great person who asked the question about the wind is pretty bad tonight in Estes again. Mm -hmm. Any chance the fire spread? Is there any chance of there being any open flame at all on the fire right now? So, you know, what I've seen so far the last two or three days, I would say it'd be really unlikely. What, what that would require, right, is it would not be a surface fire because there's still snow on the ground. So it would require there to be enough heat in some area for it to get up into the crowns. And then we'd have to have continuous crown cover enough for it to carry through the crowns. And that would be pretty unlikely uh, with today's weather and or this evening's weather as far as temperatures and humidity. Um, although the wind, again, is, is not a good factor, I think the rest of the uh, environment will help us uh, keep that out of the crowns. Okay, great. And can you give us a little more detail, or maybe Rob can, on why the containment is 64% for the Cameron Peak Fire and 0% for the Thompson Zone? And I know this gets complicated, especially when snow comes, because it's hard to determine underneath the snow what's going on. Rob? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so when we talk about containment and, and uh, as a quick shot, when you look at it, right, anything that has uh, a black line on it uh, is what we is called contained. Uh, for us to be comfortable with calling something contained, and that's when we feel that we're at the point where the fire is no longer going to move, and then the next step after that is controlled, and then we call it out. Um, but any of these areas that, that have black line on them are, are areas that we have walked, we've worked, a dozer line's in there, crews have walked over it, and when crews go through and secure line, and, and even with all the technology we have and all the things that we can do, uh, the number one way that we contain a, a line is we put a crew out, they get on the edge of this line, and they grid it, they walk the edge of the line, and they take their gloves off, and they feel around on the ground, and they make sure there's nothing hot. We, we've got all this technology, and we're back in the cave, putting out fires, calling containment is, oh, hot. We keep working on this until it's not hot. Um, and then we get the percentage of containment. Um, our GIS specialist, our mapping people, uh, who developed this beautiful map for us, will go in, and they'll just, as we, as ops comes in and says, I'm feeling comfortable about this, I ask Kyle almost every day, how much more of this can we turn black? Kyle says, I think we're going to be a couple of days out and we'll be able to turn all of this black. He turns it black, the map people do that, and then they run the perimeter. It's a computer program that runs it out for them and tells us how much is black line and how much is red line. Now, the reason there isn't any containment line on here is that we haven't had what we would call boots on the ground in this area. 
We haven't been able to get in and actually touch it, and that's part of what Kyle was talking about. If we start looking at some areas in here where we can go direct, and we can get some folks to go out there and walk, take a look on the ground, look back and forth for 100 yards, 200 yards, depending on what the, what the area looks like in there, start feeling comfortable that there's nothing in there that's gonna rekindle and move out, we'll turn that line black, and as that starts to go, you'll start seeing more of that percentage coming up for that area there. Um, we do have, as he was talking about, uh, indirect containment lines that go out. Now that's not gonna be a, a controlled line until the fire gets to it and when it stops, then we mop it up and then we would call that a contained line. So there's a couple of steps that we need to get to to get to that point. Great, thanks. And I'll give you this one, Rob. What are the chances of a reburn within the areas that are in the black? And does that happen often? And as a 25 year smoke jumper in Alaska with all sorts of crazy fuel, weather, wind, rain, snow, ice, you have a lot of experience with changing conditions and reburns. Um, from what I have seen so far from the imagery that I've seen from the operations folks flying around, a lot of the areas out there have burned incredibly clean. Um, it's super dry. The fuels, the large fuels are really dry and they're burning up almost completely. Uh, a lot of areas, especially like in here, right, there's just nothing left out there to burn. Now any place where there might be a section where it's gone underneath and it's just turned, it burned the surface fuels but didn't burn all the leaves off the brush or left a lot of stuff standing, then there's an opportunity for a reburn. Um, when I started tonight, I was talking a little bit about what we thought, what we're seeing out here and the time frame before it would get really active again is that same bit, and Kyle mentioned it too, that it's the fine fuels that we need to carry the fire along the ground. Uh, when, a, when a log starts to burn and the wind hits it and it throws embers out, those embers land in those fine fuels, those keep going, and that just perpetuates itself. Right now, as long as we have the snow on the ground, and then even for a few days after the snow's gone until it really dries out, um, that, that fuel bed is not what we call receptive. So embers can land in that right now. We can have some of those stump holes, some of those large logs that are still burning that could have the wind blow on them and you might see some flame coming up out of those. That's where we're seeing the smoke coming out now. But as those embers take off and land, they've got nothing to keep them going. They're landing in snow, they're landing in, in mud, and they're landing in wet brush, wet uh, pine needles and aren't able to, to travel. So I think that gets to Absolutely. kind of what you're, what you're talking about. <clears throat> Thanks, and we, we have had several questions over the last days all throughout our different feeds about the use of aviation and how we use aviation. And, and some of the locals are really hoping that they'd see helicopters dipping out of the lake and hitting the wispy smoke spots that we showed on YouTube. And I wanted you to address that, how we use aviation, risk benefit ratio, how we fight fire. Sure. Um, one of the things that we look at for any mission that we're going to do out here on the ground is a, is a risk assessment, whether it's, it's having the folks walk in to here to take a look at what it looks like, whether it's having our people using equipment to open up this road line and take some of the brush out of there, whether it's flying aircraft in some place, that's, we're asking a person to take a risk to do that job. So, and especially in aviation world, when thing, they have a bad day, it's generally a really bad day. So we, we think really hard about where we're gonna have our aircraft do work. We use them quite a bit, we use them a lot, you've all seen them here a, a bunch. Um, one of our issues uh, up to this point, one earlier on, we weren't able to fly because of weather. Once we were able to fly, because it was nice, the intel that we were seeing as we were looking around out there is every place we might try to put a bucket down and pull water out is still frozen. So hard part to get water out of that. We could use what we call a hella well, where we fill it up with water and they come in and dip out of that, but still, for aircraft to be really effective, it's a combination of aircraft and people on the ground. And, and their spotters, their workers, their folks that are down there. So when that helicopter drops, as he's moving and putting his water down, there's someone on the ground to say, yeah, good shot, hit that one again. Or, you've got it, now move on to the next one. So it's a concert work, it's a, it's a teamwork thing from the folks on the ground. Even our retardant drops are called in by people on the ground so that we get the, the retardant aircraft to put that retardant right where we want it and say, yeah, that was good, or nope, you need to put down more, or you need to go a wingspan to the left or a wingspan to the right. Um, so not having people on the ground, it, it wasn't advantageous to, to put water out there right now and it would have made more of a mess. Um, it also, um, one of the things that it, it's hard to understand because when a house catches on fire, we put water on it and it puts it out. On a wildfire, we put water on it. It still doesn't put it out. Like I said, when we call this contained, that's because somebody went up there, walked along the edge of it, hand felt a bunch of things, and made sure it was out. When we put bucket drops on things, somebody needs to go back in there, stir it up, make sure that it's clean, make sure that it's out. Um, you know, when you throw a bucket of water uh, on a burning log, 
it doesn't put the log out. Or you make your campfire, you throw your first bucket of water on the campfire, that doesn't put it out. You eventually have to stir it, mix it up, and make sure that everything's put together. Same thing out here, it's just a really big campfire. Okay, great. And so why don't the firefighters just put on like big down coats and bibs and ski, you know, like boots and triple layered up and, and get out there and do a long Arctic shift in this, you know, 18 inches of, 18 inches of snow plus? Um, well, uh, and again, I feel qualified to answer this one having um, lived uh, most of my life in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, the cold saps you uh, very quickly. Uh, and to get out and try and work in the cold, um, that equipment that we need to be able to put the fire out is, is water mostly, right? And if we have water coming through a hose at cold enough temperatures, that'll eventually just freeze and it causes problems with that. All of our fold tanks that are out there right now also, those big tanks that we put water in to pull out of are also frozen. Um, but the real part is for, for our people, our, our firefighters to go out there and do that, um, your effectiveness just drops off very quickly the longer you're out there in that cold. And I've, I've tried to do that before. We've been out and done that where um, we're out working. You can only work so long before things start to slow down for yourself. You start thinking about the cold, and then you need to go warm up, come back out. Um, it's doable, but it just isn't very effective. And in this case, where we are right now, the fires, the, the snow is doing the work for us. And as long as that snow is, as Kyle talked about earlier, melting slowly, that's putting more moisture into the ground. Um, as opposed to, I, I believe back in September when there was a bunch of snow on the ground here, it warmed up really quickly after that. There was a lot of wind. It got really dry really fast. The snow didn't have an opportunity to do as much work. This slower melt that we're getting right now, the, the mucky roads out there, the muddy places that we're all cruising around here in town, um, that, that snow's doing more work for us than it would. Again, us doing the risk assessment of sending people out there, it's risk versus uh, reward. What's the gain if we send people out there to do that? And right now, uh, uh, the snow is doing the work for us. Just as soon as we can get out there and get on the ground and take a look at it, we still want to get out and walk these places and take a look at them and, and put the crews to work. We're going to do that just as soon as we safely can. Right, and I did see the Tahoe hotshots out there hiking around uh, the, the, the Estes area, so that's really good. Um, speaking of that, we um, have a question about the rumor out there, there's a rumor apparently, that the National Park is refusing to allow retardants to be used due to, quote, environmental concerns, and that no local, county, or state firefighters will be permitted to fight the fire in the park, only for service personnel. Is this really the case? Um, well, uh, I have not uh, asked the park if we could put retardant out there because it hasn't been a need right now, so I can't answer that question. I do know that uh, the folks that we have out there working right now are a mixed bag of personnel for us. We uh, uh, come from a lot of different agencies to do this job. Uh, we refer to ourselves as kind of the green pant nation. Um, we all come together. We all work together. There's, there's multiple teams, multiple crews. No one's checking IDs at the gate. Copy that. And then one more Estes question. Why did the town of Estes, or in, in your opinion, and the person's asking quite frankly, why did the town of Estes Park and the Larimer County Sheriff's Office decide with zero containment in that area to send residents home and invite visitors once again? That was a long conversation that we had yesterday up in Estes Park at the, at the Emergency Operations Center. We went back and forth, and again, uh, as, uh, as subject matter experts, as folks that have seen this before, uh, from the fire perspective, we feel that the snow has done a good enough job right now, that there's a long enough time between now and when the fire could possibly get up and really start to move again, that we could let people back in. Um, the immediate threat of it getting up and running back into town uh, has subsided. We also have, because of the, the fact that we've slowed down fire activities every place else, have more resources that we can put to, to bear on this. If it does start to move, we have a plan, we're here, we're looking at it. If it starts to move, we can do, we can take some actions. So uh, the answer to that question, to without the containment on there, we're feeling good where it is right now. We have a good containment line that we can work off of, and now we're looking at trying to get in and get direct on it as soon as the weather changes and do that. If we didn't feel comfortable being able to have folks walk in there and start going direct on it, we also wouldn't feel comfortable letting people or making the recommendation that, that they could lift the, the evacuations. Okay, great, thanks. And we have uh, two more questions for Kyle. Thanks for that marathon, Rob. I'm sure <laughs> and over. If, if people at home are keeping track, that was about a 12 minute straight Q&A. And thanks for all the great questions out there, folks. We appreciate that. Um, 
So, quick question. Um, how is Storm Mountain and the Cedar Park area doing? I know you addressed it this morning on the live feed. Yeah, so um, the Cedar Park area, the word I got today was that we were able to get in here and take a look at this. It looks really solid, and in the next day or two, we're likely to call that contained. Uh, this piece is a little more complicated over here, a little bit more difficult ground, uh, but uh, overall, we feel like we've got some good plans in there. In the next day or two, we'll be able to get folks in there and uh, take a good look at what we have. Okay, great. We should great. know more. <clears throat> and then how did, the, uh, how did we get the Thompson zone of the fire that was on the other side of the divide? Not totally sure, but from my perspective, um, you know, had a fairly uh, significant, I would call it, uh, you know, East Troublesome fire run uh, with strong winds and uh, another rare event spotted over the Continental Divide. So access for the team that was managing these Troublesome would have been very difficult and very long. And so we, uh, the team, the Rocky Mountain team picked it up and then we inherited that. Perfect. Two more quick questions for place names. Masonville. Okay, out here. We know that's a cold area. The line's yes. black, but the woman who lives in the area would like to know if they're mopping up behind the post office. So, um, word I'm getting is that this looks pretty solid, that we don't believe that there's much threat from the fire to come out there. In fact, we're starting to backhaul some of the equipment. So, I think, in general, that should be mostly done. Great. And then Belaine, the top area there that we talked about, that little teeny bit of red in the map. Right. That and the, we suspected that that was a mapping error. We did have folks go out today and take a look at it. Uh, I am waiting to hear back from them, but I suspect that that will be called uh, contained very soon. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. And I want to thank uh, both Rob and, and Kyle for um, answering all those questions. Kyle, for um, reading those uh, through the comments and our folks behind the scenes in the public information office uh, to help get your questions answered. We'll continue to monitor those questions. I want to stay active and engaged with all of you. I do want to just go back really quickly. Uh, so it was related to one of the last questions that, that Kale asked of Rob. Uh, again, just reminding folks uh, regarding um, Rocky Mountain National Park and all national forest system lands on Canyon Lakes Ranger District of Arapaho Roosevelt are closed, so there's that limited recreation opportunity. Again, as a reminder, uh, town of Estes is currently open, but with limited services. So again, just reminding folks, visitors who choose to come, knowing uh, this information, just be prepared to leave at a moment's notice if those conditions change. So again, that's part of that dialogue that Rob was just talking about, where everybody got together, they looked at all those things. That's, again, part of this uh, ongoing discussion that we have with all of our cooperator, cooperators to make sure uh, that we're working together, um, coming with one voice and, and uh, presenting a good plan and, and sharing that information with you. Um, regarding sharing that information with you, I want everybody to just to remind everybody um, how we're doing that. So we do that on NCWEB, INCIWEB.gov. You can search that, look for the Cameron, uh, Cameron Peak fire information on NCWEB to get information about what's going on, our updates, photos, maps, et cetera. That's all there. There's links. Uh, you can get a link to a YouTube site where you can see videos. Uh, again, I, we have information here on Facebook. Uh, again, I want to plug the YouTube. So for folks that don't have Facebook, you can go to YouTube and see those videos. They play a little bit cleaner for some folks. Uh, so that's another uh, source. Um, as you've seen, for folks here on Facebook, we have our morning updates. Kale's doing those in the morning, our Breaking It Down series where we uh, look at different aspects. Today, you saw a walk around of the incident command post and what that looks like. Uh, as, uh, as well as the uh, Captain uh, Shellhammer from uh, Larimer County Sheriff's Office. So we have all that information. We want to get you information in, in a bunch of different formats and a bunch of different content. Um, and then lastly, I also want to emphasize that our, our community branch, people that are out in the community on, on what we call our trap lines, talking to folks, providing information in the community, which does include folks going up to Estes Park. So that's, that's another source of information. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention to folks that we have, um, we've gotten off our, our, our standard Monday, Wednesday, Friday virtual public meeting schedule that we're here tonight, it's Thursday. Uh, we will be looking at when we're scheduling our next virtual public meeting. Uh, so we will post that stuff on uh, the information about that next meeting on uh, Facebook. It'll be in our updates. We'll share that. We'll make sure we get that uh, covered again in those uh, morning session, so we want to make sure you know when that next, uh, when this next virtual public meeting will be, and we'll get that out to you. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everybody for your time. I want to thank you for joining us again tonight. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Have a great night.